Welcome to Sometimes There's Side Eye, a podcast about two friends having real and unfiltered conversations about dogs and people. Listen as we talk about our lives with dogs, training, behavior, share some laughs, and a whole lot of banter. I'm Heather. And I'm Christy. And today we have a special guest, Lorelai. Welcome, Lorelai. Hello. We're so happy to have you here. I'm super glad to be here. Lorelai is going to be serving as our ethical breeder. We mentioned on our last podcast that we would be doing an interview with an ethical breeder. And so that is Lorelai. And I'm so excited to meet you today, Lorelai, because I know some of your puppies that you've produced and love them. So it's so nice to actually get to meet you. So just so everyone knows, Lorelai is a breeder and she breeds under Sierra Stafford's and Bull Terriers. Mm -hmm. And she's also an AKC breed judge. She is a breeder mentor, and she is also a foster and a huge proponent of rescue. So we're thrilled to have her here. Prior to meeting me and becoming friends with me, Christy was not aware that there was decent breeders out there, ethical breeders out there. So she has learned through me purchasing Tiago and that whole process. And then over the last five years of us being friends, we have gone, I've gone from believing only AKC, blah, 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 to I actually believe that there's people who are doing doodles and they're doing it the best way possible and they're doing it ethically. So there has been this transition and it's like, we can talk about it all because Mm -hmm. I think it, it, whatever you want to talk about has relevance. And our whole thing is we want people to understand that there's value in ethical breeding, meaning at the basis. We're doing health testing. We're, t- we're understanding temperament. We know what we're doing. Right. We're taking our puppies back. We're selling on contract. That's, yeah. you know, the basis. Right. And then that there's value in that on the flip side, because it takes the burden off rescue and everyone working together. And that's where we're coming from. Hopefully. Yes. Yes. In the best circumstances, yes. which is why you're here. But I, I hope I, and we know it gets messy. <laughs> yeah. We know it gets messy. How many dogs do you have right now? I have six dogs. All right. I have five shepherds and one bull terrier. Do you want to give a little about each one? I'll, I'll go real quickly. Freya is 12 years old Stafford. Madison is an 11 year old bull terrier. She's had two litters. After that is Chopper, who's 10 years old. And then we go down to Scarlett, who you know, Heather, mm-hmm. and she's six years old. Ruby is three and Debbie is two. It's quite a range. I like my dogs range far apart so that when one dies, I have a lot of other dogs to distract me. See, you're real, (laughs) you're real smart that way. (laughs) I know we briefly mentioned what breeds that you are currently breeding. What is it about each of those breeds that you really enjoy? What took you to those breeds? I'm really, I'm interested in the bull breeds. I love them. I even love the, the bull breeds that end up in the shelters. They're, in my opinion, they're the best companion dogs. They're comical, they're silly, They're super loyal. Sometimes they're too needy. Um, (laughs) They're they're great dogs. They're very trainable. They're super smart. And then, of course, we have bull terriers. Mm -hmm. I did start out in the late 90s with miniature bull terriers, and I really loved the breed. But they had some health issues in the 90s. So when I my female bull mini bull started to age out, I decided to go to Stafford's because they were a much healthier breed. Mm. After I had Stafford's for a few years and I'd had my first, maybe second litter, someone approached me about a bull terrier puppy who was very well bred from a a kennel that's very good. And I went ahead and got her. So I kind of got back into bull terriers, but the standard size. And, And a lot has happened in health in the last 10 to 20 years. So I feel really good about my dogs being healthy and it's easy to keep them being healthy. And there's not a lot of surprises like there used to be. Mm -hmm. Mm. Makes sense to me. Yeah. And when we say Stafford, everybody just, you know, that's a Staffordshire bull terrier. Correct. Yes. And we're, we're just going to shorten it up and say Stafford. You have a crew here of bully bully dog lovers. I've had four pit bulls. Christy has had a wonderful pit bull and all of our friends are bully people. So we, we get it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Good. I totally agree with that goofy personality yet loyal. All of those things are what made me love the breeds too. Mm -hmm. So other than Stafford's and standard bull terriers, have you been involved with breeding any other breeds? 
I grew up, my parents bred Russian wolfhounds and showed them. And I had, oh. attended my, I showed my first dog in 1973. So wow. I've been around for a long time in the show world. And yeah, we usually had litters in the house. And we were usually running around to shows on the weekends when I was young. And there's so much that I just know about breeding that I was never taught. It just, I got it absorbed into me. That is so cool. Yeah. Wow, I didn't I didn't realize that you grew up in in yeah. that world. What a difference between the breeds that you grew oh, up very. around too. <laughs> my yeah. mother's choice and my choice. <laughs> oh yes. yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Why did you decide that you wanted to start breeding? I didn't want to start breeding at all, oh. but I got a great dog. And yeah. when you have a great dog, it's a shame if you do not carry on uh, and I think you do the breed a disservice when you have really good dogs and you hold them to yourself like if you have a great stud dog and you don't let people use them shame on you our goal is to make the breed better and protect it for the future and some good genes are always good to have so I had a great dog I don't know if you remember her Heather her name was Daphne well, I, I never w- I never had the pleasure of knowing Daphne, but I have heard so many different people talk lovingly about her and how much they loved her. So, yeah. Yeah, she was good. She won seven All Breed Best in Shows, and she had won many, like 40 group ones. So she was at the Best of Show ring 40 times in her okay. career. She was the top staff wow. in a row. Oh, yeah, she was a great dog. I couldn't not breed her. No. And for those listening who are not out in the show world, what Lorelai just described is a really big deal. And it's especially a really big deal for a female dog. I mean, a lot of times it's harder for a female in the show world. We call it a bitch. It's really hard for a bitch to, to really take over. That's amazing. Congratulations. I I didn't know that. And these puppies in the litter box today, grand pups. Just so everyone knows, oh. Lorelai <laughs> has one day old puppies on the ground and she's waiting well, to join us. So she has great, great grand puppies from, from Daphne. That's very cool. I guess then you kind of answered our, our next question, which is why do you continue to breed? Because you have great dogs to add to the gene pool. Yeah, and it's become a hobby. It's become a passion. And breeding I sold puppies and I made new friends and some of those people Mm. went out and showed the dogs and started breeding and we've just become this great community of sharing and teamwork and partnering so I guess it it, it's it just grew that way I love that I love that too. I explained in our last episode how purebred dogs can become such a community Mm-hmm. And it's something that's so, so beautiful. Uh, so many of my friends are part of my Rottweiler community. And I grew up in the breed with those people. So it's really special. Yeah, it yeah. is. Would you say that community piece is one of your favorite parts of breeding? Or do you have other pieces that you feel like are your favorite? My favorite parts of breeding? I really, really love rearing pups. Mm-hmm. This starting with the pups being born and watching them and checking out the personalities because the personalities start showing at three weeks. They are who they are. You remember Pilot. He is who he is. He is he's exactly today who he was then. Yes. And we knew it. And and when I said, Christina, that's your dog. I know you want a different one, but that's your dog. I was right. And to this day, I feel like we were right. Yep. And when we came to meet the litter, I think they were six or seven weeks. Seven and weeks. And you were worried because, so everyone knows our friend Christina got a puppy from Lorelai and you were worried that because she wanted a girl and the puppy you knew was hers was a boy. Yeah. And, but man, when we met him, there was no question. That it was, was obvious. Puppy. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Yeah. And that's really fun. That's really yeah. fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it really is. I know this is a very big question, but can you walk us through how you make decisions in your breeding program and what that looks like? How do you build it? I I honestly, I can't really say I have a program per se. There are some people that are breeding many litters. Over 10 years, they might have bred 20 litters, whereas I've only done eight, well, this is the ninth litter between two breeds. So I'm relatively small. 
I do like to, uh, this is my first litter that's actually was a line breeding. I'm tying in dogs I've bred together. And so it's taken me that many litters to get to that point. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a person that likes to work with partners. So I have co-owners. I, I co-own my dogs myself with my breeders. So it's not that I, I force that upon the people that buy from me. I'm a true proponent of co-owning dogs. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I work with my partners and we choose a stud dog together. And there's a genetic component and there's a, a phenotype. So it's a genotype and a phenotype. Phenotype is what the dog looks like. And a genotype would be what's in the pedigree. Who are the dogs that go back? What are the traits that they had? What came forward with them? Where were the behavioral issues? Were there some health issues? Were there some structural issues? What are you going to bring forward mm -hmm. accidentally or on purpose? And so we try to take a look at all of that. People are getting better and better. And we've got a lot of good dogs these days. And that can be really good if you have two solid, good quality animals and you really want to solidify the type, mm -hmm. it can be a good thing. And then once you have that strong, uh, say you have a stud dog that has that's line bred, that becomes a valuable stud for other people to outcross to mm -hmm. because he is consistent at throwing what he throws, what he gives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you don't get that until you make that dog solid with line breeding. Outcrosses produced by accident. Line breeding produces by design. Does that help? Yes. I like that last part. For just, I just want to elaborate a little bit on that. It's not a problem to never line breed. It really isn't. But what you notice as a breeder with a litter, I have six pups in there. I would like to see consistently throughout the whole litter. But if I'm outcrossed, I'm going to see... When, as these puppies grow up, they're going to all look different. They're going to take on the traits from the different family. So it, it's totally okay to do that. If you have good temperaments and they're healthy and pet homes are perfectly happy with them. But yeah. if you want to really hold on to the type that makes a Stafford triple tear, you want to look at that dog and say, wow, that dog has a ton of Stafford type. Mm -hmm. You're going to want to do a little bit of line and inbreeding. Mm -hmm. I think that's where having an ethical breeder comes in who so understands their breed yeah. and knows what they're looking for so that they can pick those, those person, like those qualities that they want to see mm -hmm. in looks and personality and temperament, all of those things and how, because that's not something that you just come across in your everyday breed. No, no. And you after you have to be very intelligent and very knowledgeable. You can't just be a brand new person and think you're going to do line breeding. And there have been breeders over the years that have boxed themselves into a corner and they've got nowhere to go and they have problems. They have to ditch the whole program and start over. Mm -hmm. And it's done. It's And it's heartbreaking. There are well-known kennels in the Rottweiler breed. And I will find myself at a show and I'll be like, oh, I really like that dog. And then I'll look and I'm like, well, no shit. I like that dog <laughs> because <laughs> you know what I mean? If I would go back in the pedigree, it's yeah. obvious why. And part of the reason why that type is so tight and I have that certain, I mean, my dog looks like that type, you know, yeah. and part of that is line breeding. People are, people are right. really getting really solid in that type and they're building off it. But as you both said, you need the experience to understand what you're doing. So one, you don't box yourself into a corner. Two, you don't get problems that occur over and over and over again. And then three, that you're making sure that you don't get kennel blind to just that type because right. you might need to balance. That type might be what you love, but you also need to work on the rear or whatever else within the dog. You need to dog. in every now and then. Yes, and make sure that you're keeping keeping what you're breeding exactly in the direction you want it to go. So I know like you mentioned picking Christina's puppy for her I'm saying, you know, I know you want a female, but this is the right puppy for you. Right. And I don't think necessarily everybody realizes that with ethical breeders, a lot of times they will um, be watching the puppies, rearing those puppies, and then saying, this is the best fit for what you've told me you right. want. Can you go into that a little bit? Like how that typically works for you yeah. or what you found? You know, there's a, a lot of, there's still today, a lot of breeders you come up with your thousand dollar check and you go into the litter and whatever puppies are left, you pick. And I think that's a really bad way to do it, especially with terriers, because they can be the poster child for ADHD and every problem out there. I mean, that's normal for them. They're not broken. That's just who they are. So I really, really try to watch carefully. 
and and I try to talk to the people. What do you, I get? Try to get to know these people once I've cho- once I've said, yeah, you're a good fit. What do they? Is their lifestyle like? What do they want to do? And I watch those puppies carefully, and it's amazing. It's unbelievably amazing how as the puppies hit about six to seven weeks old, the match happens and it's, they, they know, everybody knows them. Like it's, it's unbelievable how right I am. I don't even know how I do it. It's some sort of intuition, but it's definitely interviewing the people really well. And it's watching those puppies. And sometimes I think with one of the puppies in pilot's litter, he was a little bit shy, a little bit fearful. And the girl that wanted him, I said, he's a perfect match for you, but you have to be aware of this ahead of time. When she came out to visit at the puppy party, she totally agreed. She totally understood. She still wanted him. And he's been a great dog for her. And he went to the right home. Had he gone to some big, tough guy, this because he's a big, cool dog. If he had gone to somebody else, like it was heavy handed, he would have just not th- thri- thrived at all. Yeah, he so, would have wilted. Right, right. And so I think that's hugely important. Advocating for your puppy. So it's not, it's, it's about making sure that the puppy that you've raised with love gets to the right hands that understands them. And I always tell people you have one time to advocate for your puppy and that's before they leave the driveway. Oh, uh, yeah. You're, and you're advocating for your buyer too. Well, I want them to be successful mm-hmm. and be happy. Yeah. I have told people the night before they were supposed to pick up a puppy that I wasn't comfortable and I've pissed some people off. But you know, I have to, I have to do what's right for me, and I think it's the same in rescue because a lot of people will complain that rescue groups they won't let me get a dog because I have a, another intact male or something. And I'll say everybody should be able to approve the homes as they feel fit. Don't go out of their comfort zone. They want to place the puppies with with what makes them feel good, and and no one should complain about that. That is a very interesting, interesting perspective. And there is value there. I need to sit with that because I've, <laughs> I've complained about that before, but you make a good point because we're all, everyone's trying to place the dogs exactly where they think they should be. And if I am a proponent for a breeder being able to do that, then shouldn't I then be a proponent for the flip side? Well, Absolutely. Hot damn, Lorelai, you just put me in my place. <laughs> Which is hilarious, Heather, because I feel like I've said that to you even on the podcast. And you're like, well, I think the difference. In but my Lorelai mind, says it. <laughs> and they, like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> I think the difference in my mind is that there's so many dogs in rescue that need homes. So I'm like, we have so much of a surplus. Can we be the most critical? Can we, I mean, I was declined to be able to to adopt Tater, my bulldog, and we're clearly a great home for him. So it's like, there's, you know, there's a a balance. There's not always enough time to get to know everybody. And I actually think in rescue and fosters, you have to pay more attention and do a better job at choosing homes than a breeder. Because Mm. the breeder, we're giving a nice clean puppy with a good temperament and no bad jujus. Where some of the (laughs) rescue dogs have some baggage. And they deserve to have your best attention to where they're placed. I've always said just because someone wants a dog doesn't mean they should have one. There's an awful lot of those people. And um, and rescue, I think there's a lot of good intention people that want to rescue a dog, but it may not be the right match. Mm -hmm. And for me as a fosterer, I love my fosters as much as I love my puppies. And I care very much that they get to the right home. And I will call the uh, foster the, the rescue coordinator and say I don't like those people or I don't like the kids and they if they trust me that that dog won't go mm-hmm. and that's important to me I'm not going to foster dogs if they're not placed well mm-hmm. I guess uh, and I completely agree with what I like I hear what you're saying so then my my next question and we're totally going off track here but my next <laughs> question is then we, what do we do about the overwhelming need in rescue with, you know what I'm saying? Like there has no, to be I, a balance. I know exactly what you're saying. We can only do what we can do mm-hmm. and placing dogs in, in a pro, placing dogs with fingers crossed to me, isn't the answer. And I'll say what I say to everybody. And I don't want anyone yeah. to get mad at me. There's a whole lot of worse. I love that. There's a, a lot of worse things that can happen to a dog besides a humane euthanasia. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And, I, and I know that's awful, but 
you know, and I think there's a lot of rescue groups out there just pulling dogs and pulling dogs based on their comfort zone. And then they're going to place them based on their comfort zone. And I don't have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. Or I have a problem is what I think I do have a problem is we, we qualify these homes up, down, backwards and sideways. But any person who wants to foster and raises their hand can foster the dog. Mm -hmm. And that can make or break the dogs, which, you know, that's another story. It's such a valid point. No, you're you're right on the mark. So Christy has fostered countless dogs over the years and she's a fantastic foster. And her and I have had conversations like that. The last dog that she fostered, she made a huge behavioral difference in that dog. And she made him way more adoptable than he was when exactly. he started with her. Yeah. yeah. Yep. No, there's, you. you make a valid point. It, it's a tough, every single time that Christy and I start talking about this type of subject, we're like, it's really complex. It gets really messy. It is. It is. It is. <laughs> yeah. What are your expectations with staying in touch with puppy buyers? So first you feeling like you've made this perfect match and I've seen it happen. And then you're handing off this puppy that you've put all your heart and soul into. So what is your expectation moving forward with with keeping in touch with those buyers? I acknowledge the fact that when someone buys a puppy from me, they think it's theirs. Mm -hmm. That's what they, they're, that's what their expectation. It's my puppy. We're going to take the puppy and run. And they have no obligation to me. So I try to choose people that I have a sense that want to stay linked a little mm -hmm. bit. And everybody's a little bit different. And here's what I, I try to sell people on things that there are breed specific health issues that if you run to the vet and they're going to charge you $500 for tests and you could have called me and I would have said, here's where here, I point you in the right direction. That's a lot cheaper. So I try to hit them in the heartbreak and the money belt <laughs> um, for why they should stay in contact with me. Mm -hmm. I will co-own with most people. And by co-owning, they've got a link to me. And I like, I like to get pictures. I like to see what they're doing. And, you know, Facebook has really helped because everybody shares all their puppy stuff on mm -hmm. Facebook. I've learned over time the kind of homes I don't like. And that's that's tough because I'll get I'll get a family contact me and the husband will contact me. We're the best home ever. And I have to really gently tell him there's a lot of best home ever. You're not the only one. And I mm -hmm. only have five puppies. And um and I've got a target customer, I have a target buyer. And I, I've learned I don't really care for families with children. And it's not because my dogs wouldn't be great in a family with children because I don't get them. So mm -hmm. I don't know how to interview people and see kids. Are these kids going to be good or are they going to sit on the dog? I don't ah, know. So I stay out. I stay within my comfort zone. I think I'm getting off track, but no, I you're I, not I'm still going no. there. Yeah. That's, um, that's very interesting. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I, I kind of have a profile of somebody I like. If a man contacts me about a Stafford, which is common because the bull breeds, if I won't sell to that man, I need to meet the wife because the wife will make or break the dog's life. Mm. Super important. If she's not all in, it's not going to happen for me. I'm trying to think there's some other things. I like to go, if, can I go out to dinner with you and have a good conversation or is it going to be uncomfortable? Do I really like you? Are we like-minded? Mm. Are you? Do you already know everything or are you going to be open-minded and ask me questions? I like people who are who will ask me questions who will listen to me and go, Oh, I get it. I get it. And it, then it feels like we're on the same page and that's kind of how I do it. And, and I've made mistakes and I've even made mistakes when I think it's a perfect match. So those things happen, but that's kind of my process. Do you mind? And I know this wasn't on the list, but do you mind just giving a little information about what happens when you do have a mismatch? And I know it's different for every situation, it, but it's a hundred percent out of my control mm -hmm. and mismatches come in strange shapes and sizes. What might look like a great match on Facebook and social media, my heart might be breaking in the background because I know things and I've talked to them behind the scenes. And so, you know, there's not much I can do about that. I have had a mismatch in that's been in the breed and well-known and I've had a mismatch in um, performance. I'm I'm real careful now. I don't I don't have deal breakers in performance. I don't have deal breakers in that are already in the dog fancy. 
but I do really like to get to know the people I know. Are they going to partner? Are they going to listen? Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's, it's hard to say. It's, it's really hard to say what that looks like. Let's say that you have someone who decides that, that the puppy is not a right match for you. Your puppies exactly. always come, they come back Absolutely. to you. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Let me know sooner than later. Mm-hmm. Okay. I, I've had it happen with a pilot's litter. Mm-hmm. And I think it's good for people who are new to this world of ethical breeding to understand how committed ethical breeders are to the puppies that they produce. And I know that you went to great lengths to get that puppy back and make sure that he was placed in the right home. And now he is in a great home. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes it happens and it comes back to the breeder to make sure that that puppy gets rehomed correctly. Right. And I, I think that it's, it's a good person that recognizes it and gets that dog back to me quickly Mm -hmm. it's when they try to work it out over months and months and you're talking to them on the phone and you can't get them to give the dog back and you know it's not going to work that can be very and and i don't think people realize how how heartbreaking it is when a a dog is 10 years old of mine and i feel like something's going on i'm still holding that little baby that was that dog in my hand feeling like i tricked them and it's it's very sad Oh, that makes me sad. I know it is. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's difficult. Yeah. It's one of the hard parts of breeding. And and if, and of course, it's probably the hardest part, choosing the right homes. <laughs> Which yeah. happens to be the next thing we were going to talk about. What is the hardest part? I can imagine that that would be so, so two difficult. Things. Mm-hmm. Two things. And I'll go for the first one right now. Um, the whelping process. You know, 24 hours before the puppies are due and then all the drama. Oh my God, I'm so sick. I hurt mom. And then the puppies start coming and is that first puppy going to come out and is it going to get stuck? Are you going to have to run to the vet and all the puppies need to come out and then you want them to be healthy. You don't want to have any defects because birth defects happen. That's really hard. It's very scary. And you, you want to have vets on board. And nowadays there's a lot of vets that will not do an emergency C-section without spaying your bitch. Mm -hmm. And that's really bad. And there's even some emergency vets that just won't do it at all. They're not equipped to do it. They don't have that staff to do it. So you have to hope your regular vet can number one, fit you in. You know how hard it is to get into a vet these days Mm -hmm. with emergencies and that they're going to be in tune to getting the puppies out and getting her sewn back up in case you do want to breed again. Mm-hmm. It, it's really, really hard. It's very stressful. Uh, Ruby decided to have her puppies Friday morning. Uh, there was a lot of drama starting at nine o'clock Thursday night. So I didn't sleep all night. She had her first puppy at six 30 and luckily it was breached, but she popped it right out. And then, then every half hour, the rest of the puppies came in it. It was so unbelievably smooth. I thank God. I'm so proud of her, but um, that's a very, very scary time for me at least. Mm-hmm. And the next hardest part, of course, is choosing homes. Mm -hmm. It's waiting for the right people. Some breeders get super anxious around eight, nine weeks if the dog doesn't have a home to go to. And I, um, I have learned the hard way. Just hang on to that puppy. Enjoy it. Love it. Keep training it. Keep stimulating it, giving it good life because the right home always comes along. Mm -hmm. Um, I've had one of my best placements get placed at 16 weeks. Really? Yes, absolutely. I will hold the puppy until the the right person comes. It makes sense. You don't want to force something that doesn't feel like a good fit. No, because people are, the phone's ringing. It's not that I'm not getting people. I've turned down a lot of people or it's just not felt right. I was wondering what do you feel a lot? Because Staffordshire Bull Terriers aren't a super, that specific breed is not super well known. So I was yeah. wondering, do you field a lot of inquiries? They're but- surprisingly popular. During COVID, the phone was ringing off. I mean, I was getting, I had eight puppies and I probably had 40 or to 50 inquiries. <sighs> and I literally just told people, I'm not doing any choices until seven weeks. And I just deleted everybody, unless there was a couple that I thought might be good. It was crazy. Right now, I've had people that have been waiting for years that are going to get because <laughs> I haven't bred in a while. Mm-hmm. So there's at least three people that have been waiting quite some time. And I've got one person that's on the fence. I might keep one. So that leaves two spots. So I was thinking today, should I advertise on AKC Marketplace or or Facebook? We have a, um, a Stafford Triple Terrier Pups group for health tested puppies. And I thought, no, I'm just going to sit tight and wait. 
-hmm. because I, I have a I have a rule don't place all your puppies too soon because then you'll be boxed into a corner and not have anything to choose from I'd rather grow some puppies up to choose for myself yeah that makes sense as well yeah right. because but if you want your next two, pr prospect yeah I'll grow two two females a little bit longer and see see which one I want to keep so much to think about, you know, so much. <laughs> yeah. My mind is swirling. I'm like, there's so much because my next puppy is two and a half weeks old right now. And so I'm like in the midst of this, you know, yeah. and there's just, I have such a respect for breeders also sitting and talking. It's like, whoo, there's so much to think about. Going back to what you had said earlier about people saying, I am the perfect home and you have 50 people contacting you but maybe they're not the perfect home for the dog you have available you can be the perfect home mm -hmm. and not be the perfect home for a specific dog like, right and, and that's good for you or or you're not my yeah. perfect home but you're going to be another breeder's perfect home right exactly. well and I know you were you have the list of breeders that you refer people to right yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. because I think Christina originally got referred to you <laughs> He did. Yes. Yeah. So I love that relationship too, when breeders have a list and they're kind of in part of that community and can say, Hey, maybe I don't have something for you right now, or won't have something in your timeline, but here's a list of some people for you to be able to go and contact and see if there's a match there. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. If there's all this hard stuff when it comes to breeding, what's the, what's your favorite parts about breeding? Oh, well, it's definitely the specifically breeding. It's definitely the partnership with the co-owners, which I love. I co-own my female with people who got a puppy from me years ago. And I co-own the stud dog that I used. So it's those partnerships because it's not just me getting excited is them too. And that's super, you know how we all like to have a community, mm -hmm. but um, just rearing the puppies. I mean, I, I love to weigh them. I love to mark my calendar for everything. In fact, I have to remember now today, Monday, I have to call the vet to make the appointment for the shots in eight weeks because that's how far out they're booking appointments, mm -hmm. but I'm just getting organized. You know, I follow puppy culture pretty well mm -hmm. and um, I try to get prepared for what's coming all the different milestones that I put the puppies through and I try to plan, okay, when am I going to have my puppy party and who's going to be invited and when, when are they going to go and to their home? So I, I just really enjoy it. And I, I love puppies so much. I love photographing them. I love taking them for walks. I think you've seen a lot of my videos where I will oh, go yeah. like Hyde Piper with puppies following me. It's fun. For people who maybe don't know what a puppy party is, could you maybe explain that a little bit? The puppy party literally comes from puppy cultures program. Uh, and it's, to me, it's a genius. It's just amazing. And I spend about a week prior to the party doing what we call powering up the clicker. So the puppies have a good head. When they hear the clicker, they're like, oh my gosh, something good's going to happen. So then I have all these little obstacles, little miniature agility equipment. And Heather, you went to the party. That was a great party you went to. Mm -hmm. um, so I set up this miniature agility equipment. I put two people on a piece of equipment and they each get a puppy and they basically, when the puppy offers to interact with the equipment, they click and treat. So a lot of things are happening. The puppies are getting used to a lot of people. They're getting used to a party environment. They're seeing a novel piece of equipment that they've never seen. And we give them all a few turns, put them away for an hour, go eat lunch or something, come back and give a few more turns. We'll video, take pictures. And it's just really fun and it's so good for the puppies. Mm -hmm. And I try very, very hard to make my puppies so they're ready and bomb proof for this party because I've been to some other people's parties where it looks like the puppies were a deer in headlights. They're like, oh my God, all the people and we don't know what's going on here. So I try really hard to make that party successful. And that's basically it. I'm, I'm a big fan of puppy culture. I love the program. And for me, I, I can't really explain it all sitting here, mm -hmm. but I can say that it's really helped me evaluate my puppies better and learn more about the temperament and the behavior of those puppies than any other way of looking at puppies because they've been through so many paces. You just know who they are. 
Essentially, it's a puppy rearing program that's set up on a very strict schedule based on development and different stimulus and yeah. so on and so forth. Right, and right. it's very sciencey and nerdy and it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say, I feel like this is one of the places that responsible breeders have really helped rescue through puppy culture, introducing the puppy culture and giving uh, rescue puppies kind of this really solid foundation, even though maybe we don't know what, what their background is or their pedigree, but right. we can at least lay this foundation for them to set them up for success in yeah. the future. And so I feel like that is like such a significant step that breeders have taken to to help the rescue community and further that that rescue yes. community yeah. and and bringing <laughs> solid dogs into the community in general. Mhm. Mm yeah. Well, because we have a friend who has, you know, a puppy and mom and pups specific rescue here in Phoenix and they adopted puppy culture and I don't know if that would have happened had the founder not had relationships with people that were also had relationships yeah. with ethical breeders, you know, and yeah. that's incredible because that knowledge is, is helping on both sides. And I, I love that because that's guess great. what? It's yeah. what's best for the dogs and people. Absolutely. Yeah. I do want to ask, there's a lot of talk and I'm one of those people that feel like there are not enough really solid ethically bred, well-bred dogs that are available right now. And that comes from me trying to help people who are just average families right. that will come to me and say, I want a puppy. And then I go and try to do research and help them find so that they're not going and buying a dog off Craigslist or whatever, and trying to direct them to someone who's really taking the time and health test and all of the things that go with ethical breeding. So what are your thoughts on whether or not there are enough, enough good, I hate to say good, no, ethically, no, I know it's ethically bred saying, puppies. Yeah. 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 Cause I go through this too. Who do I refer someone to? I only know two or three people like me. Hmm. Now, one of the things that I think is very important is your, most of your pet homes don't care. They don't know to care. They don't, they just don't. And when they do say, oh, health testing, then they ask the breeder, the breeder says, oh yeah, I do health testing. When maybe they do a little bit of health testing, maybe they don't do it all. So the big problem is until the pet home actually cares about proper health testing based on the breed club website requirements and the health committees, then there's nothing driving breeders to get there mm. because, because breeders that don't do health testing they would do it if all of the people that asked them for a puppy said, can we see your health test results? So that's part of the problem, number one. Number two, I have breeders now that I know, you guys, there are people that say, oh, they're not ethical, but I've known them for 15 years. I know their temperaments are solid. I've heard pretty much the dogs that have health issues and don't. And I feel like they're a good referral for me for a pet home. Mm -hmm. They're gonna get a decent dog with a good temperament. It's gonna look like a Stafford and it's mm -hmm. probably gonna be healthy. And and health is pretty broad. It's not just the genetic diseases. I mean, it's good construction. So they're not going to blow their knees out when they're six years old and have expensive mm -hmm. surgery and a tough rehabilitation. So I have not, I've not, it's not that I've lowered my, my requirements for a good breeder or a effort. And, and it's really hard for me. That's why I said it's a loaded question. Mm -hmm. um, and, but when I know, when I know somebody cares, like Christina cared very much about all these things, I would never refer her to one of these other people. So it's just about me knowing who the person is. Then I go, okay, this is going to be a great place to get a puppy. Mm -hmm. And and that's kind of how it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Christy and I, our last episode, her and I were just kind of going back and forth on the whole idea of ethical breeding and like, what does that look like? And I, I also said, there's so much tribal knowledge with breeders in their particular breed and yeah. there is so there are breeders who can tell you every single thing about every single dog that's behind every single dog they bred, right. you know, and they know everything so, so well. So I'm, I don't want to say run from those people, 
But I do think that there needs to be serious education. And I think that there needs to be a real understanding for what you're getting yourself into and the breed that you're getting into. And then what what the breeder expectations should be. And that's probably not going to be someone that you find selling a puppy on Craigslist for $100. Probably not. Let's just say no. Nah. (laughs) Yeah. A lot of people that are the pet homes that are out there, I'm amazed now. In fact, I was even told this by somebody on Facebook that was looking for a dog. They get mad when they go to the SPTCA website because they want to find a puppy in three clicks or less. And I'm like, wow. I know. And it's like, it's like, have you even been to the SPTC website? Oh, but I can't find anything. It's, it's, it's a research project. Nobody wants to research. They want immediate gratification. Mm-hmm. And, and, it, and I, I really think that, what do you do about it? Mm-hmm. I know that every, all of the, all of the club member breeders, they don't all health test. Mm-hmm. They don't all do hips. I mean, it's just common knowledge and they will even say they don't do it. And it's in our code of ethics to do it. Mm-hmm. So you, it's up to the buyer. And it's really, in my opinion, it's educating the pet homes. Mm-hmm. I have a form. It's not a form letter, but it's a, a response document. If somebody writes me an email and says, I'm looking for a puppy, blah, blah, blah. I say, thank you so much. I've attached a document to help you. And in that document, I lay out everything that they should look for in a breeder and everything that they should look for in a puppy and the, the lines and they can take it or leave it. I mean, what else? I can't do much else than that. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to ethical breeding, one of the things that I think a lot of people forget and don't consider is my biggest concern for any breeder, and that's why I will refer to some of these other breeders that you might not consider ethical, I want to know the quality of life of your breeding stock. Yes. How well do you treat your breeding stock? Do they get to do the things they love to do, or are they stuck in crates and kennels 24 hours, 23 and a half hours a day? To me, that's important. And how are the puppies reared? Are the puppies in the basement? Or are they up in the bedroom with you? And can the can the buyer go to your house? And these are real things. And so they might be a great breeder, but if I can't go to the house and the puppies are reared in the basement and you do all the health testing in the world. So it's really kind of what is an ethical breeder is mm-hmm. such a, a hard thing to define. Mm-hmm. I agree. It's a, it, it, it's a sticky, sticky, tough, messy, messy question. Yeah. And I, I think in the end, we ended up saying that the puppies are sold on contract. Mm -hmm. The breeder takes the puppies back if there's an issue and that they, they know what they're breeding. They understand what they're breeding. And that is in regards to health temperament, so on and so forth. And that they're thoroughly educating their buyer on what they're selling. So if that's a Stafford, you're educating the people that they're getting a terrier. And Mm -hmm. if it's a doodle, they're educating that this dog is going to need lifelong grooming and brushing every day. And so just whatever that whole thing looks like. And then that's a good description. mm -hmm. And then the rest in between is, is what the person is, is comfortable with. So yeah, I agree. It's a really difficult question. And everyone's personal ethics is their own definition. Yes. Yeah. And I do think it comes down to, to educating those pet homes, because I don't think a lot of people know if they knew those things existed, they would care about them, but they don't understand what's in it for them. Cause like, okay. So, so this dog is tested. What, what does that mean for me? If you just throw that around, I don't think the average pet home gets it. Right. Oh, I could have done without three leg surgeries for my last dog. That would have been amazing. Like, I mean, I still would have taken Lucy. Like that's not up for debate, but it would have been nice to not have those health issues, you know? Yeah. 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 And I think it's also tough because then someone's going to come back and say, well, look at Heather. She went to an ethical breeder with Tiago and he has elbow dysplasia and she's been through hell and back with him. So it's like this tough balance of there's value there, but you also, there's no perfection. And so the magic wand. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There's there's no guarantees. Mm -mm. Stacking the deck in your favor as much as possible. Right. Yeah. We have talked a little bit about 
your interactions or your work in the rescue community. You're a foster, but can you talk a little bit about your work in the rescue community and your interactions with the rescue community being a breeder and sort of how those interactions go and how you're received? Yeah. About, I don't know, 13 years ago, it was funny. I was at a kind of a party that the rescue group was having with all of their, not all of their, any, they were inviting all the fosters. It was a pizza party and they were there and, and the gal Lin Hao wanted everybody to individually stand up and introduce themselves. And I know when it came to my turn, I stood up and said, my name's Lorelai Craig. I am a breeder and I, I work closely and I could have sworn I heard a collective gasp in the room <laughs> and, and I didn't care. I am sure you did. <laughs> I didn't care because I think that that needs to come out. Today, I have no problem, but I work with people who are understand the value of actual experienced fosters. And so I think that's, I don't have a problem with it today. In fact, I even have on the side of my car, happy, healthy puppies come from AKC and me, which I know that's going to get me in trouble. And I've had people turn me down for fostering a litter of puppies. And I, and I said, that's fine. I, I don't need the work. And, you know, it's too bad for you because I do the best job of anybody. Yeah. But, um, but, but nowadays, um, it, I think it's getting better and better. And again, that's one of those things that kind of I've always questioned. Just because you love dogs a lot and because you want to help in rescue doesn't mean you're qualified to evaluate behavioral problems and fix them and live with them and um, be able to really make that dog better. Because I think I've gotten some fosters in here where I'm like, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do with you? You know? are you going to bite me or are you going to have go over way over arousal or something? And I will move those dogs back pretty quickly. I mean, I'll, I'll be, I won't I'll keep them for as long as I can. I'll work with the rescue coordinator. We'll get them into a, a board and train situation. We'll get them evaluated better. Someone that can handle them better than me. And I'm pretty experienced. So I kind of think some of these people who really want to foster. And then of course, the another thing that I think is interesting when you foster a dog and Chris, you know, this, you don't, it's not your dog mm -hmm. and you, you can't, you don't get to make choices and decisions for it. The rescue group owns that dog and they might want to move that dog on and you might be, Oh, don't, don't send them to the kennel. You know, there's nothing you can do about it. That's how it is. So it's really important as a foster to remember, it's not your dog and things may not go hundred percent the way you want them to, but you just do the best you can while you have the dog. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I would say I've, I've had over the years, I've had two fosters that I did have to send back. One was fantastic in meet and greet situations with other dogs, but yeah. living in a home with another dog, he definitely tried to kill my dog. And then it was unprovoked attack. And then the rescue was like, are you sure? And then they, then once he went back, they were very much like, oh, this, yes, he's very social social distance you know yeah. but like living in a home they kept seeing the same thing then too yeah. and then another one was did have to go to a board and train because it was a situation where I was like I, I and I felt terrible because I didn't feel right having that dog go to anyone I knew yeah I was like I can't recommend this dog in yeah. a clear conscience and I did you know and again it was a, a situation where I was at risk and my dog was at risk yeah mm -hmm. And I think that that's important to recognize that as a foster, you know, when they cut your losses, you, you can't jeopardize your home dogs or yourself. Mm -hmm. Do you sort of have a list of rescues that you regularly work with, or do you just kind of see the dog and you're like, Oh, I gotta, gotta do that one. I work with um, rescues where, I mean, I, I, I break in somehow and I'll, I'll start rescuing and there's always a certain amount of trust that has to go back and forth. I work with Bull Terry Rescue Inc. right now, Susie Ming, and she knows me very well. I've always got one of her fosters here pretty much all the time. And I just know how she operates and I know how long it's going to take to get this dog marketed. And I know she's very busy and I'm very particular about the dog I take because of what I know about the group. And that's a lot of the reason why I take puppies, puppies that are marketed well, that have excellent pictures. They'll move quickly once that marketing starts. Mm -hmm. So I don't usually like older dogs and puppies. I can assimilate with my pack. So my dogs aren't on the back burner. The puppy becomes part of the family right away. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. makes sense to me. But I won't go to another rescue group unless I'm very cognizant of how they operate. Cause I don't need a dog coming in and becoming my dog and not moving. 
I want to know that they really, they don't just rescue dogs. They place dogs. Love that. So important. Yeah. 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 I'm not sure that people who are coming from just the rescue side of things realize or are aware of the amount that breeders of purebred dogs actually do support the rescue and shelter community. What are some of the things that you see, you've already talked about some of them, but maybe you see things that other breeders are doing that are a support to the rescue and shelter communities at large? You know, I'm not, I'm not really sure. I think by and large, a lot of breeders do not get involved with rescue. I think they want to put their head under the covers. Um, and I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm not judgmental on it. But I can say that every single parent club for every purebred dog has a rescue presence. Some have more than others. The Bull Terrier has a huge rescue presence all over the country. They have a lot of dogs. They have a huge problem. The Staffordshire Bull Terrier Club, we have one rescue presence. We're a national rescue and we will find dogs around the country and we will send members out to ID the dog, get them pulled, get them, you know, and evaluated and so forth. Uh, we don't have a lot of rescues. So that's one way that breeders, I would say, through the club rescue. Most breeders and most people are willing to, to donate money. Mm -hmm. We all know that the money's easy and it's the volunteering that's hard. I try not, I, I have a friend who wants who's always pushing for breeders to get involved in performance. You need to get involved in performance so you everybody knows your dogs can do the things they're supposed to do. And it's like, look, I breed, I show in confirmation, I do rescue, I don't have any more time. So a lot of breeders that are doing a really good job breeding maybe two litters a year and they're out at all the dog shows all around the country, really proofing their dogs as quality specimens, they don't have a lot of time either. And, and I do, I have noticed that when, high profile breeders get involved in rescue, that there are some other little fringe breeders that get involved. And there are a lot of breeders that will help out. And I'm not saying they're the best choice. They definitely have the knowledge. The dog is in good hands usually, but sometimes breeders have too many dogs. They don't have enough room to take another dog on. Mm -hmm. I always joke, I want to build some more kennels so I can take more rescue dogs. But do I really want to get rescue dogs and put them in kennels? That's like yeah. the shelter. Yeah. So, you know, I think everybody should do what they can. Uh, we have breeders that do help with transportation that will foster that pretty much a lot of people will provide money. We have a pretty good rescue fund and, and it grows. And then we have the money when maybe we have an elderly person who's aging out and they've got 16 dogs. So we need to jump in and help with all those dogs because that's common. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see, I mean, over the years in Rottweilers in particular, we've had some really unfortunate hoarding cases and yeah. things like that. I don't even remember what year now I was helped with the Texas 200 and that was over 200 Rottweilers. Yeah. And so the National Rottweiler Breed Club steps in and they coordinate the effort and they get those, they got those dogs moved to different places across the country, different Rottweiler rescues yeah. and breeders and whoever could take dogs and manage to move those dogs out in a fairly short period of time to be safe and then ultimately get evaluated and, and adopted out where appropriate. So that's a place where the breed club for purebred dogs really does step up and support in rescue, just like you were talking about with Stafford's. I think that there's a lot of value there when it comes to supporting purebred dogs in general. So Those dogs never enter the shelter system. They did I not. We do a claim. lot of work with that too, keeping dogs in the homes or keeping dogs from ever needing to be like we've we've created a whole new Facebook page just we call it Stafford Rehome and Rescue Support oh. because if we can help before the dog gets critical in the shelter get that dog placed th then we've we've done good by keeping them from ever getting there 100% absolutely yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 that's an important piece too i think just what Lorelai said taking care of 16 dogs for somebody who's aging out or making sure that a dog is rehomed before asked to go to the shelter. That's a lot of things I think your average pet owner or the rescue community isn't seeing, right. yet it's such a huge support for the rescue community. So you don't necessarily have to be fostering a dog or in the, the rescue itself, but preventing dogs from going into rescue or shelters is helping. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And it's such a huge piece of helping out 
rescues and shelters. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like this part in the background, this moving piece in the background that is making it so that those dogs never have to hit the shelter floor. And that's, that's and I think major. a lot of rescue groups are doing that now too. They're not just focusing on pulling dogs. They're focusing on becoming a community outreach program, mm -hmm. um, providing some of the services that people can't afford mm -hmm. and helping them with training issues mm -hmm. to be able to keep their pets yeah. and the homeless people to be able to keep the pet. Yeah. I mean, if we can keep the dog in the home that they already have by just giving some resources, right. we don't have to then put the dog in a shelter, provide more resources, and then right. find the dog a new home. Right. So it's a win all over the place. <laughs> yeah. So is there anything else really important that we didn't talk about that you would like to touch on? Because if you have something that's important, I definitely don't um, want to miss it. You know, I think we hit everything. We did really well. I know that the the one thing that's kind of disheartening is the rescue movement has done a really great job with the adopt, don't shop. And as a result of that, we lost a lot of great breeders. A lot of people said, I'm not going to do this anymore. I mean, I've, I've taken, it, I can't, I can tell so many stories. Even the vet industry has been pushed by the whole adopt, don't shop and early span neuter and don't support breeders. So, you know, we breeders talk all the time about how we try to find a vet who's really supportive of breeding so that I think that's hurt a lot of breeders and it's made it challenging. So when we talk about how can we get, because there are people like me, I always want a purebred dog. And if you give me a shelter is my only choice, maybe I won't have a dog. So it's not like I'm going to go to the shelter if I can't get a purebred dog. I want what I want. So I think people have to understand that if you get rid of all the ethical, these long-term cornerstone breeders of our breed, we're losing gene pool. We're losing so much that helped us preserve and protect the breed. And, and I think that's important. I mean, there's nothing going to slow that down. You know, it, it is hard. So I'm a person who loves a purebred dog too. And I really, I really am right there with you. Christy is someone who doesn't have a particular breed, right? So we, a mutt. It's I know. Fine. So yeah. we we talk about love, love. <laughs> we talk about Austin. I'm the person going to the breeder who wants a purebred dog, and she's the person who's going to rescue, and maybe that'll flip flop and our lives will sure. change, but that's where we are today. Yeah. And I also have a deep rooted fear of losing purebred dogs and losing breeds that mm -hmm. we have had for so many generations. And right. because let's face it, a lot of people who breed purebred dogs are getting older. We are and, old. It's an old folks sport. <laughs> well, and you see confirmation dying. You see all this stuff and mm -hmm. that's a whole nother conversation. I think about that too. I worry about it and it scares me. I've spent my entire life saying that I never wanted to breed dogs ever, mm -hmm. like ever. Yeah. And only in the last couple of years have I found myself considering it and feel like I probably will because I'm scared that some of the breeds that I love will no longer be available. And that's scary to me and it's sad. And when we lose those cornerstone breeders and those breeders, those were our mentors. That's where the knowledge gets passed down. There's not always a book on everything. Some of it just continues to pass down, like you talk about tribal knowledge. Mm -hmm. And, and when once it's gone, that, right, then you end up with a bunch of people that are starting from square one. They're starting over again, reinventing the wheel. Mm -hmm. When somebody before yeah. us always made all those mistakes. I think one of the important things as you guys are talking about this, what's swirling around in my head is that as these cornerstone breeders are pulling out, it's not preventing backyard breeders from continuing. Not at all. So instead of these solid, well-researched, well-educated breeders and breeds coming out to the public, instead we're, we're not losing purebred in the sense of you're still going to be able to get a lab. You're still going to be mm -hmm. able to get these dogs, but from a much less ethical source. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's, what's changing is, knowledgeable. is mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, we're not doing the shelter any favor by rooting out ethical breeders. Because there's what still going to be a demand for the, the puppies. puppies. Yep. The people yes. still want the puppies. 
And if yep, you take away the, the good breeders, the solid good breeders, then they only have one place to go. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it scares me because like Laura, I said, once that knowledge is gone, you can never get it back. It is gone. For another hundred and years from now, if people stay in it, if they'll people learn stay in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so scary because like we talk about, that doesn't just hurt the breed. It hurts dogs. Yeah. You know, the, the, the knowledge of the temperament and the stability and all those, like you said, if you have a buyer who has an issue with their dog, you want them to call you because you've right. been in Stafford's forever right. and you have that knowledge. All of that's gone. It's all gone. Right. Yeah. That scares the shit out of and me. I'll be honest. <laughs> and as somebody who used to do hashtag don't shop adopt. Like I, I was that person hashtagging those things yeah. on all my Instagram posts with my rescue dog. That has definitely changed for me. And, and now my thought process is shop or adopt responsibly. Yeah. Whatever yeah. you do, do it responsibly. Right. Yes. Oh, that's a good place to end. It was really fun, you guys. Thank you for having me. I so Thank appreciate, so especially with new puppies, you doing yes. this. Um, Thank you. I was super fun. This is my first Thank time doing anything like this. Yay! I love it. Thank yes. you so much Yay. for doing it with us. Thank you, guys. If you've enjoyed this episode, rate, subscribe, and review on your favorite podcast platform. And check us out on Instagram at sometimes their side eye and engage with us. Yes, we would love to hear from you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. And we will be dropping new episodes every other Thursday. Bye. Bye.